Welcome everyone to week two of Brain Turns. As I said, my office uh, got kind of turned upside down and, and put back together. And so um, a little bit of difficulties this morning. Uh, and then we were in our tumor board conference where we go over kind of our, our most recent cases, the imaging, the pathology, we make decisions as a group um, in terms of how we're gonna treat our patients. And that's really important, right? Because you're basically getting internal second and third opinions, it's not just one person, myself basically dictating how you're going to be treated. And so, uh, you know, multidisciplinary tumor boards have been associated with with improved outcomes. Um, and it's something that's absolutely go. critical to what we do. So, um, Quinn, I still can't hear you if you're talking. Thanks all for the advice. Um, so anyway, so, you know, uh, because we got a little bit delayed, what I'll do is probably just talk to you guys through a case. And so let me... Um, pull up that case and then we'll, we'll go through there share the screen all right can everyone see the screen now pull up the chat All right, good. Sorry, you guys are getting feedback when I talk. Is it better or is it about the same? Let's try this. Is it any better now? Okay. All right, so we'll leave it like that then for now. And then I don't know why I'm not getting any. So. Anyway, all right, good. Well, so I figured we'll talk about this case. This is a good case because it's short and it's kind of fun. I'm gonna leave the chat open for people who have questions. Try to make it interactive as well because um, we all know that I love that. So we'll kind of talk through these these portions of this. So this is a, a young guy, I think he's like 25 years old, who presented initially with a uh, headache. Um, and it had you know been going on for a while, but then it started getting worse over the couple of weeks prior to uh, coming to my office. He actually ended up in the emergency department for this, was discharged. They told him he had a benign cyst. And so we looked at the imaging and you know we said, that doesn't really look like a benign cyst. So we got him an MRI and this is what it showed. And no other symptoms, just headache, that's it. And so uh, I know none of you are neuroradiologists, but if anyone wanted to say what they think they see on this, um, type it into the chat and we'll kind of go through your thought process. All right, I see someone said a simple cyst, a tumor, all right, enlarged ventricle, occipital tumor, hydrocephalus. All right, so you guys are kind of on the right track. And so, you know, let's start with this. Um, is What area of the brain is this? All right, someone just said cerebellum, so we've got that. And uh, when we look at the cerebellum, we... Um, we worry about, is it in the brain or is it out of the brain? What do we think? Is this something intrinsic to the brain or outside of the brain? I'm being silent while I wait for the chat. Intrinsic, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so intraaxial, we call it. That's another term for it. And it's a big you know, black circle. And then there's this small kind of white spot at the bottom of it. Um, and you know that's... Uh, what we call an enhancing nodule, all right? And sometimes we refer to that as a mural nodule, all right? And then we have a large cyst, and I'm gonna let it play a little bit longer so you guys can see with the fourth ventricle, because someone mentioned that. It's not really compressing the fourth ventricle, or I'm sorry, it's not really obstructing the fourth ventricle, but it is compressing it. This would be where the fourth ventricle sits here. You can see just due to the mass of this thing, it is causing that. And he may have some mild um, hydrocephalus, but for the most part, it's the pressure being caused by this. And so, you know, when we, when we think about things that can arise in the cerebellum, we look back over, you know, the 100 years of neurosurgery that we have, um, and we kind of make decisions about what we think things might be. So does anyone have any idea what arises in this region and what it could be in a young, in a young person? All right, medulloblastoma, yeah, that's, that's one of the options, definitely. It's on the differential, right? It's a tumor that arises in the posterior fossa, most common in young people. What else?
cyst, um, well, there is a cyst associated with it without a doubt, but it's not a cyst by itself or else this would be a very boring conference. Diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma, that's something that happens in the posterior fossa, but typically in the midbrain, so less likely here. Glioblastoma can happen, but also very less likely. Craniopharyngiomas only happen in the pituitary stalk, so wrong location here, but good guess. Astrocytoma, yes. So pilocytic astrocytomas classically have a mural nodule and a cystic component. So it's very, very possible. And then, yeah, someone, uh, someone looking at the title, someone cheating. It's okay. I forgive you. Um, but we'll keep going through here. It's my fault. You're not cheating. So, yeah, this is, um, there's another type of tumor that hasn't been mentioned yet. Well, hemangioblastoma, and that wasn't mentioned by the group prior, but that's actually the most common posterior fossa tumor that happens in adults. And it's actually, this, uh, you know, it's associated with a genetic predisposition to developing these. Does anyone know what that is? No one yet. So, no, not tuber sclerosis. That does predispose you to tumors, um, but they're happening more in the lateral ventricles. Not a Wilms, but I love the guessing. I love the interaction. So, there's a disease called VHL or von, Hipp um, von Hippel Lindau, which is uh, it's a chromosome abnormality on, on the third chromosome. And it's uh, associated with tumors that occur specifically hemangioblastomas in the brain and um, as well as other tumors like kidney tumors, things like that. And so because we worry about that, we end up getting total spine imaging to make sure there are no other tumors. People with VHL can develop multiple tumors throughout the neuro axis. And so I'll tell you, his was negative. He only had this one. So that kind of shrinks our, our differential diagnosis or, or our best guess as to what this is to either hemangioblastoma versus, you know, a pilocytic astrocytoma for the most part. Although, you know, things can look different. So. We do, to get to this, um, we have to do a craniotomy. Does anyone know where that craniotomy would be located? Suboccipital is correct. That's right. And do we have to do both sides or just one side? Yeah, I mean, it's actually kind of dealer's choice. Um, you could take off the inferior, the whole suboccipital bone along the back of the skull here, or you could just take off one side. I, I choose to do minimally invasive surgery when I can, so I only did the one. Um, what you guys are looking at here is actually, it's kind of a side view. I don't Can you guys see my mouse moving on the screen or no? Yeah, good. So here where the forceps are, this is the superior portion of the uh, suboccipital bone or the occipital bone in the suboccipital uh, kind of space. This is the midline right here. We actually drilled away most of the midline. So we are looking a little bit contralaterally here, all right? This is the right side of his head, okay? Down here are the neck muscles and things like that, all right? Uh, the bone doesn't regrow. We, we put it back for the most part and then we plate it. We'll get to that later. So here what we're doing is we've exposed the dura. This is the dura and we're putting a stitch in, a tenting suture so that we can open the dura safely over the cerebellum. This is usually a split thickness stitch, and then it allows us to cut the dura open, and we use an instrument here to make sure we're away from the brain. The patient is face down, just so you guys know. So he's uh, he's completely what we call prone, arms tucked at his side and his head down. And the insertion points of the neck muscles, well, they get stripped down, so we, we have to remove them, and we'll sew them back into place at the end of the case, and they usually adhere nicely. So here we're slipping a cottonoid. This is a piece of cotton under the dura so that we can make sure we open the dura safely. And what you'll see is as we cut towards the midline here, we want to tent the dura over to the midline. We don't want to cut right through the midline because there's actually a, um, a big vein, a sinus that goes right through the middle here. All right. Down here, you just saw that's some CSF being released, which is going to allow the brain to relax a little bit. And now we get our first look at the tumor. And so obviously this is under microscope um, guidance, but we see this is our tumor right on the surface of the brain. And we see it's a little cluster of blood vessels, all right? And that's why it looks pink. It's because it's all um, vascular. And that's supportive of our diagnosis of a hemangioblastoma, which are really you know vascular tumors or like tiny little micro AVMs. And so here we're looking 
and we've popped that cyst and that's what that little hole is you're seeing there and that allows us to also further decompress the brain so we're able to get in there and release some of that fluid that had accumulated and that's going to allow us to manipulate this tissue more freely without damaging the cerebellum now under microscopic guidance we're going to use bipolar cautery to, to sever all of the little vascular connections that are going to this all right and you can see here we cauterize and we cut and we put a little bit of traction on the tumor itself as we work our way around it. All right, now in the cerebellum, you know, what do we have to worry about neurologically? Not super much. So coordination, exactly. But this is the majority of his problems are due to the mass effect of the cyst. The tumor itself is very small. So by removing this, he actually, we would not anticipate significant post-operative deficits here. And then here, what we're doing, someone just said cutting useful parts of the brain here. We're, we're really not. We're cutting the vascular pedicles to this tumor so that we're able to take it out. Not all tumors look like that. Someone asked before. This is a very specific finding. And you see, we're just outside of the capsule of this. And we're taking all these little kind of red strands, which are all blood vessels feeding this tumor. So you can see cutting these as we cauterize through and around. And a little bit of traction on the tumor itself allows us to really find these vessels and get rid of the kind of intervening brain in between. So we'll zoom out a little bit. You can see we're moving into quick time here. So this is a good little place to pause. So we walk, this is exactly what we're talking about. We're working along the margin, we're devascularizing the tumor itself. And we're shrinking the tumor a little bit by putting the bipolar itself on the tumor itself. And that'll allow it to kind of, you know, it, it kind of, it's like cooking chicken, right? It, uh, it tightens up the proteins, allows you to have more of a vascular hold on it. And, you know, someone asked, how do you identify normal and tumor blood vessels? Well, it really has to go, has to, uh, depends on where they're going. If they're entering into the tumor capsule itself, they're probably uh, tumor vessels. If they're kind of passing by, or if they're moving on to somewhere else, then they're not. So you can see here, we're preserving that one vessel on the bottom by cutting the connections to the tumor itself. We're retracting it off. And then where it goes into the, the tumor capsule itself, that's where we, we separate it. So same thing here, vessel into the tumor and it comes out. Someone just asked, if this was an area where you risk vision impairment, how would the tech do their job in order and, you know, I'm not sure what that question means. Um, maybe rephrase that so I can get it better. How did the tumor cause assist? Well, that's a good question. So there, that's actually the removal of the whole tumor. And then we're going to look around in here uh, to see what the cavity itself looks like. And you'll see as we go through it that it's a very kind of smooth surface. And that's because the fluid has been kind of chronically expanding it. What we're putting down there is something called Surgicel. That's the actual tumor itself. It's only about a centimeter, 12 millimeters or so. Uh, Surgicel is a hemostatic agent. This is not a gamma tile case. This is a benign issue. And so by removing this, actually, he'll never, the cyst will go away and um, we'll never have to worry about it again, really. Uh, it is very common for these patients to present with just headache. Um, and that's because of that mass effect. So whenever pressure goes up in the brain, one of the symptoms is headache. The tumor causes the cyst, so it causes the cyst by, by kind of abnormal blood vessels. Um, and basically what it does is the blood, you know, your brain constantly makes CSF. And so as it pumps more blood through there, it kind of increases, it changes the kind of hemodynamic or the hemostatic forces in the brain. Uh, let me show you the post-op films here as we go through. There was no second lesion. This is the only one they had. So you can see this is the pre and post op film. So here the lesion with the mural nodule down below, you can see the mural nodule is completely removed and the cyst has been significantly decompressed. And actually, if you were to look at their um, six month follow up, there's only a very, very small residual cyst. This is what the pathology looks like. And so you can see all of these, uh, you know, the microvascular proliferation in this, all this red is actually blood vessels, normal blood vessels throughout. CD31 is a, uh, it's a blood vessel wall um, stain. And so all these stains are used to kind of help confirm the diagnosis. So uh, I don't know what that means. We'll skip that part. And so this is kind of what we were talking about in terms of how these things come. So it's either solid or cystic in terms of how they, uh, how they develop. It's the most common primary intraaxial tumor, which we talked about. And it can be part of VHL, which we talked about. 
about 70% of these are sporadic, so they're not associated with VHL. Although VHL, um, this kid was right at the right age, right? He was either in the fourth or third decade. He was kind of in the late 20s. Um, the nodules, this is a classic nodule for this. And you can see here again, the vessel walls are thin. They're not, they're not normal vessels. And so they leak water, but the proteins don't go through. And so they, they push out the, the uh, fluid. Um, we already did talk about MRI than total neuraxis. Polycythemia this happens with, you know, really with more of these things or bigger ones for the most part. And then we're curative because this is a sporadic uh, case of hemangioblastoma. We typically don't do um, embolization in these cases, so we didn't need to talk about that. So that's one case that I wanted to show you guys. And then what I'll do is I'll show you, um, let me see if I can find you another one. Give me one second, y'all. What else are people talking about? How commonly in children? In children, it's more with VHL. How would you know to continue on further and not just stop? Well, you have to, so, you know, that's a good question is when a patient sees their doctor. So he, his headaches were not getting better with headache management. And he ended up in the ER because of basically, um, you know, the headache's not getting better and getting progressive and him just getting worried that something wasn't right. And so the answer to your question is really just persistent symptoms um, would prompt imaging. So he got a CT scan. Uh, Post-op problems in this case would really just be risk of bleeding from an, uh, you know, a poorly cauterized blood vessel or a residual vessel. Um, residual tumor would be an issue. Uh, you could end up with, you know, wound infection because of where this is or even a CSF leak, because we have to close the dura in a watertight fashion. How much time does it took uh, to grow or to do the surgery? The surgery itself takes about two hours, probably. Let's see what else. It would have continued to grow. Actually, what would have happened first is the cyst would have caused hydrocephalus and been an issue. And you know, hydrocephalus can be um, fatal, so it, it's actually critical that we had to get that out. I'm going to send you guys one more. Um, we'll do another video just because I think we have enough time for it. Give me one sec. I just got to email myself because of my computer issues. Up next today, we actually have a great day. Um, the med school will be on. What else in the chat? Can this lead to Chiari? You know, it, it's funny. Chiaris are typically congenital, but they can be um, they can be caused by increasing intracranial pressure by like hydrocephalus. So it could, in theory, make one, but you would treat it by taking care of the hemangioblastoma. Did they see a psychologist? Uh, I'm not sure um, why a psychologist would be involved in this. So I don't I'm, I don't think they needed that. It's uh, it's not an infratentory supracerebellar. It's just a, it's just a suboccipital craniotomy in the prone position. Let me pull up the next one here. There was no balance disorder. He actually was pretty well compensated. Someone asked about that due to the cerebellar compression of the hydrocephalus, but he was actually he did pretty well, so there was no need for that. Here, I'm going to pull up the next video now. So I'm going to move to the image first. So the, the, for those of you watching closely, you can see that um, I already kind of told you it's a collared cyst, but this is a similar issue of a young guy presenting with um, headaches. And so this is a better case of obstructive hydrocephalus. So you can see compared to the last scan, the ventricular system here is severely dilated um, as composed to the other one. And so this is a lesion isolated to the third ventricle causing obstructive hydrocephalus. It's triventricular hydrocephalus really, or really biventricular, but it's obstructing what's called the foramen of Monroe, which is one of the ways that CSF can exit out of the brain. All right. And um, this most commonly, especially based on the imaging findings here would support the diagnosis of a colloid cyst more than anything else. This is a coronal view where you can see where this is right in the center of the brain, right in the third ventricle. You can see the vessels kind of over the top of it. And then here again in the axial view, 
you can see uh, filling up the third ventricle really. And so, you know, there you can see the dilation here of the lateral ventricle. And so, you know, in general, with a young person with a finding of a choleroid cyst with obstructive hydrocephalus, you know, your, your surgery is really indicated here. Um, and the reason is that you can cure their hydrocephalus permanently without the need of things like a shunt or, you know, the difficulty that would involve an ETV in this situation. And then the question becomes, how do you take these out, right? And there's a multiple kind of, there's multiple kind of published ways that you can do it. In the old days, it was a craniotomy, and you would go interhemispheric, meaning the craniotomy would be centered here, and you would go between the two cerebral hemispheres straight into the ventricular system, and some people would actually go through the fornix, which is here. This area is ripe with um, very important and critical structures uh, that can lead to very poor outcomes if they're not handled correctly, and the fornix is probably the most important, especially in a young person, because it's really responsible for forming new memories. Um, and so injury to the fornices bilaterally can really have devastating neurological sequelae. So we opted for surgery here. The way I classically do these is through a right frontal approach transcortically with what's called a vicor, it's a tubular retractor. And the idea is that as it goes through the brain, it separates the brain tissue centripetally with centripetal force. So you're not putting direct pressure on any one white matter tract. And in theory, as you remove it, these white matter tracts will, will kind of go back you're also not cutting through, you're separating as you kind of go through. So you'll see what that looks like momentarily. So we'll go over the anatomy of these approaches first, because like I told you, it's, it's pretty important. This is what we look at. This is the tubular retractor. This is the ventricular system here. You can see CSF. This stuff here is choroid plexus. Okay, this is a vein, and we'll talk about what veins these are in a moment. So this is a good anatomy here. So this is what choroid plexus looks like. Here's the thalamus. This is called the thalamus striate vein. This is the septal vein. And both of these veins meet here in the middle to go into something called the internal cerebral vein, which is located in the roof of the third ventricle. This is the foramen of Monroe where the CSF has to go through. And you'll see that this is where that cyst arises. And so it blocks the ability for fluid to come out. You can see the fornix here. The fornix sits in the middle. You can see it here. And then it wraps, it forms the anterior boundary of the foramen of Monroe. And so again, just any manipulation here, any damage to the fornices can have really devastating um, neurologic problems associated with it. So we have to be careful. This is a view from the top. If you were gonna go into the both ventricles, now we're gonna do this from one side, but if you were gonna go into both, this is what you would see. Again, the, the bilateral foramen of Monroe, you can see the choroid plexus kind of coursing backwards between the fornices and the thalamus. Uh, and you can see the thalamus striate veins kind of coursing down towards the internal cerebrals. That's the septal vein, which is, you can actually take that, you can sacrifice it. And again, we talked about the internal cerebrals. Pericolosal arteries, these are um, important more because they're, they put off posterior choroidal feeders and the actual arterial blood supply to these lesions is um, driven by the posterior choroidal arteries. So the arteries are always gonna be on the back end of your tumor. Cord plexus is the actual stuff that produces cerebral spinal fluid. And so it's um, very important to us, but you can, you can remove it because other things can produce it as well. So this is what we see surgically. And this is a bipolar cautery um, unit. We're in the ventricular system here with our tubular retractor down in the center of the brain. And this white stuff down here is actually a tumor capsule in the third ventricle. And you can see how we're preserving. This is the column of the fornix here that I told you is important. So we're moving tumor away from the fornix at any given moment. We're cauterizing it and retracting it. And what we want to do is at some point we want to cut into it and we want to take the uh, contents out so that we can have more manipulation of it itself. And so what you'll see here is that's the rupture there of the contents, this fatty kind of pimple like stuff that comes out of there. And then we'll remove that and send it for specimen. This approach that I do does avoid the sinuses exactly. And so you'll see, we'll kind of go back now and we'll take our time. We'll really debulk this stuff. And it's just kind of like snotty, you know, fatty stuff that's leaking in there. And you can do this in a few ways, obviously just apply a little bit of suction or you can actually kind of manipulate the capsule and kind of force stuff out. If this looks like spaghetti sauce to you, you're eating spaghetti wrong. <laughs> Unless it's like a cream sauce, maybe like an alfresco, like a fettuccine Alfredo. You can see there the the, uh, the capsule coming out there. We're applying a little bit of pressure with the suction to really milk the contents out.
<laughs> the comments are very funny right now. So again, you know, this is where we take our time as neurosurgeons. There's no rush to get this portion out. We really want to debulk this. We really want this to kind of squeeze out and eke out, you know, very slowly. This is not a novel technique. A lot of people do this. You know, a lot of people use endoscopes to perform this, um, which I don't personally use because I like to have both my hands in there and, and instruments. The working diameter here is probably about uh, maybe a centimeter. I think I use a 21 millimeter tube for this, so two 2.1 centimeters. Uh, my field of vision is not limited right now. As you can see, I can see everything. But again, we're under the exoscope here. And so again, we're debulking. We're trying to manipulate this capsule kind of out from its attachments and we get a better view of what things are what. Colleague cyst tissue just, it really just comes from epithelial tissue in the third ventricle residual. So you can see now we've debulked the capsule. The brain's much more pulsatile. You can see choroid plexus. That's one of the veins going down to the internal cerebrals here. And that's some choroid plexus. We're just going to cauterize there in the middle as we get a better view. And again, we need to preserve this vein. This vein is really important. And you can see that the capsule itself is actually kind of stuck to the medial edge of that there. And so when you cauterize, you have to make sure that your gold tips there are farther than that vein, because what you don't want to do is apply pressure or heat on that vein. And then we're getting a sense of where this is pedicled, where is, it, where is it attached to? And you can see that vein inflating underneath it there, right here, which means that we're going to have to truncate this at some point next to that vein. And so this is a, you know, those are probably five millimeter cups that are grabbing this. They might even be smaller. And again, just gentle manipulation, we're able to get a better sense of where we're gonna have to cut this. Yeah, this is on a large screen in front of me. But classically, I mean, you can do this with a microscope too. You don't need an exoscope to do this. It's just what tool you use to visualize. See, there's some more residual cysts down deep there. That's actually contralateral cord plexus attached to the vein going to the other side. And so less important to remove that. And so it looks like we're not doing anything, but just gentle manipulation actually frees up portions of these things. And so what you'll see now is we have to make a decision about how to get that off. And so we're probably going to bring back in a, an ability to cauterize that at the vein while trying to preserve the vein. And this is actually a, an endoscopic uh, cautery unit. We don't use this routinely, but you need long instruments because you're, you're operating about 10 centimeters deep in the brain through a tiny little hole. So, and you'll see we'll grip the tumor um, origin, the base there and we'll cauterize it. And it'll only cauterize between those two tips. And so I can visualize that vein passing underneath me and deliver heat there. And then I'll be able to cut that portion off without injuring the vein underneath. And that's the residual. There, I mean, it's it's. These are the veins preserved. There might be a little bit of capsule attached here. We're going to deposit some flow seal here just to limit any bleeding. Flow seal is a hemostatic agent, but the third ventricle now is completely wide open. Now we leave a drain in place just to make sure if there was any bleeding or anything that would obstruct the ventricle. And here's the post-op scan where you can see this is just a little bit of edema around, but uh, the tumor itself. I think we show a sagittal here. That's the before. And here you see the after. This is now all open and fluid. And so, again, you know, as long as the gross total resection should be completely cured, you can see nothing left in the third ventricle as opposed to before the operation. Um, someone just asked for currents or, or um, metastasis. No, this isn't really a cancer. This is just a, you know, a benign growth of fluid um, that kind of originates in this kind of tough location. And so there is a chance for recurrence. So if we left any of the tissue beyond there, it can re-expand over time. And it grows very slowly, so we watch it, and then we would know. And typically, you know, you won't have to reoperate unless it's a big recurrence and it stirs it again, but it is possible. All right. Now, uh, someone asked, how long do you leave the drain there? It really depends. I leave it overnight. Some people probably don't even use drains. I like it um, at least for one day. We get a scan in the morning just to make sure that there's no blood products there that could further obscure it. And then it comes out. The solid chunks are actually just cholesterol crystals for the most part. It's just fat. That's all. 
if it grows back again, you just watch it initially. If it becomes symptomatic or if it threatens symptoms, then you would take it out again and you could go back in very straightforward. What unexpected problems could arise? That's, that's a really good question. I mean, um, bleeding. Bleeding is the most, uh, you know, the biggest problem in this type of case. Um, damage to any of those veins we talked about, if you're not extremely delicate. Um, what else? Damage to the fornix is a real big issue. Does it affect the sleep cycle post op? I don't think so. Steroids do. What else? Well, anyway, so this is, you know, it's kind of on theme. It's a two, uh, two cystic lesions, you know, both are benign, both are curative. Both those patients are cured, um, which is, you know, it's probably the best part about neurosurgery is when you can do that, especially for, for young individuals who go on to go to school. The cyst uh, patient is actually in law school, I believe. Um, and the other one works for uh, a major corporate entity. I forget who. But, um, you know, this is this is kind of the best parts. And I'll take a minute and just thank you guys for coming along to the to Brainstorm for the second week, um, as well as participating in the, the virtual tumor conference. Hopefully the videos have been good for you guys. And a little bit of anatomic learning as well as kind of, you know, a little bit about what we do. The next lecture today is the med school, like I mentioned, hopefully offering more excellent advice for all you hoping to get into medical school um, or for even those of you in medical school.